coming up on Dialogue Weekend. Taiwan has seen a rapid rise in COVID cases and deaths this month. With less than 1% of its population vaccinated, what are the challenges facing the region? From revisiting the lab leak conspiracy to advancing a sweeping tech bill to counter China, how is the US competition with China taking shape? And what kind of strategic shift, if any, does Biden's defense budget indicate? And this week's newsmaker, now on Dialogue Weekend. Welcome to Dialogue Weekend. I'm Xu Qingdu. Taiwan has reported an increasing number of new local COVID-19 infections. China's Taiwan Affairs Office said they are willing to provide vaccines to help with the crisis, but the DPP has constantly refused help from the mainland. What's the reasons for this sudden case uptake? Why is Taiwan facing a vaccine shortage? And what can the crisis be resolved? To find out more, I'm joined in the studio by Victor Gaoji Kai, Chair Professor at Suzhou University, and Wu Zhiwei, Professor and Director of Center for Public Health Research at the Medical School of Nanjing University. So welcome to the show, gentlemen. Uh, Zhiwei, I will start with you. You know, Taiwan's containment of the COVID-19 uh, was a successful story, but somehow it becomes, you know, in a sense, like going bankrupt. You know, what happened? It was indeed doing a pretty good job, but the one thing actually, I think the Taiwan Authority uh, were ignorant or either they actually did not realize is that the virus was still uh, transmitting in other parts of the country, including Taiwan as well. So they actually became overconfident because, you know, the, 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 the campaigning saying that Taiwan was doing a very good job. So this overconfidence, the attitude of basically losing the, the public health controlling you know, uh, measures. So that's one of the, the key reasons why the virus is actually coming back. And you can see that in recent days, the virus uh, every day in you know, the new uh, infection cases actually are running between 200 to 300. So that's uh, that actually uh, puts the authority in a very dire situation uh, how to deal with the the uh, the surge of the virus. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Victor, you see, if you look at um, you know worldwide, what's the best way or the long term, uh, let's say, termination of the virus is actually vaccination. But Taiwan is actually facing, as uh, Professor Wu's words, like a dire situation because of partly because of the shortage of vaccines over there, and the mainland, of course, has repeatedly offered help uh, because obviously we have the vaccine, several of them. Uh, different types of them, and our production is strong. Uh, but all the offers, all the, uh, yeah, I would say, overtures from the mainland has been rejected by the authorities. Why? Well, I think uh, the fiasco in terms of uh, containing the virus, uh, preventing the spread, and also saving people from dying from the virus is very much the responsibility of the uh, Taiwanese local government headed by uh, Ms. Tsai Ing-wen because they became over complacent and they refused to put signs above everything else. At the moment, what's the most important thing is to uh, vaccinate as many people in Taiwan as possible. That's the very important uh, last line of defense against the virus. And uh, the fact that they refuse to take delivery of vaccines produced by mainland, mainland can produce many, many, many vaccines, dosages, for example, sufficient enough to make sure that everyone in Taiwan is uh, vaccinated. And uh, mainland China is so close to Taiwan, transportation, etc., is not a problem. And this really is very much mind-boggling why the Taiwan authorities and why Ms. Tsai Ing-wen refused to do this. Apparently, they are not putting the lives of the Taiwanese people above everything else. They are very much hijacked by themselves and by politics. And they are now begging the United States for vaccines. And the U.S. government is not really paying much attention to them. And I think that's the very much of a dilemma that the Taiwanese people are now finding themselves in. I urge on the Taiwanese government and the authorities to open up and accept the vaccines provided by uh, main authority as quickly as possible. You, you know, there's a piece, I think, you know, international media like uh, BBC, there's a piece basically saying that, uh, you know, in Taiwan now, uh, that's a choice between virus and politics. Obviously, they are blaming uh, Taiwan authorities for playing up the politics because you need vaccine. You, you don't really 
need to pay much attention to where they are from, as long as they, are, they can save people's lives. But now they are saying, oh, you know, it's a vaccine from the mainland, somehow I can't use it. What kind of politics uh, is there? Well, first of all, uh, many people in mainland China, including me, for example, we have been vaccinated. And uh, the government is urging everyone uh, to be vaccinated as much as possible. And different local governments are really promoting this as much as they can. And this is a success story for mainland China. The Chinese produced vaccines are being exported to many countries and many regions. It has been endorsed by the United Nations World Health Organization, etc. So it is considered safe and reliable and inexpensive in a sense. So I think the Taiwan Authority is really confusing the facts and they uh, want to uh, prevent the people in Taiwan from getting mainland produced vaccines for political considerations. And also they want to really position themselves as a bargaining chip in the rivalry between China and the United States because the United States is now claiming that China is the enemy of the United States. So I think let's put politics aside and let's put science above everything else and let's save as many people in Taiwan as possible. That's the most important thing now. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Professor Wu, I want to go a bit uh, deeper about this, you know, politicizing of vaccine, for example, part of the politics over there. For example, there are officials uh, from Taiwan even questioning uh, the effectiveness of uh, the uh, vaccines produced in the mainland, for example, one of them, Sinopharm, which is actually already approved by the WHO. What do you make of that? Well, well I think they are simply just ignoring the facts and ignoring the uh, the real situations that the Sinopharm's vaccine and the sun, you know, those vaccines are being used, uh, you know, more than 50 or 60 countries. And, uh, the, you know, uh, the plenty of a report and the evidence showing that those vaccines are not only uh, efficacious, but also they are safe as well. So there are plenty of uh, data out there and there is no question about it. And as you just mentioned that WHO also approved the vaccine. So this is a, a clear indication that an expert panel actually recognized the efficacious and safety of those vaccines. So I think that Taiwan government ignoring uh, this uh, vaccine and the claiming that it's uh, you know unsafe or not efficacious. Basically, I think this is what um, Mr. Uh, uh, Victor just uh, Gao just said that it's a purely politics. And I just saw new data coming out uh, in the domestic uh, uh, vaccine use that more than uh, about you know 200. Uh, 60 million uh, doses being used. Actually, the uh, adverse effect is about you know 11 cases in 100,000 the population. So this is a very safe vaccine, and you can see that uh, from other countries, the efficacious data are very convincing. So, uh, I, 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 you know, I think this is just the politics actually. Um, it's uh, dominating the uh, Taiwan government in making decisions in accepting the mainland's vaccines. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at the Sinopharm, for example, I think they published that this third phase trial data recently in the U.S. magazine, medical magazine over there, uh, efficacy 72, 78 percent, and uh, basically it's 100 percent in preventing uh, hospitalization and serious uh, illness over there. So very, very good vaccine uh, choice. But anyway, you know, people would say, you know, I would love to have some, uh, what's the you know, vaccine produced by you know, Pfizer, BioNTech over there. Uh, but then again, you know, the Taiwan government is blaming basically the mainland, saying that, oh, you know, where well, we were to finish a contract with BioNTech, the German company, uh, but because of uh, the intervention, they say it's from the mainland, somehow we are unable to finish the contract. But Victor, you are familiar with the business. You know, this is a you know, common business of practice because first thing, uh, Pharma, the, the mainland company, Shanghai based, it is the representative uh, basically of the operation, you know, the development, the commercialization of the vaccine in the mainland, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Macau in this big region here. Is that the case? Well, I think uh, the Taiwan authorities are completely confusing themselves and hurting the fundamental interests of the Taiwanese people. Why? Because they are really putting something else above science. Right now, 
it seems as if there is a big fire. So the top priority is always to put out the fire. And when you are have when you have such surge of infections and death rates are rising, for example, the top priority is always to vaccinate as many people as possible. So I think uh, the top priority for Tsai Ing-wen is really to line up as many dosages of vaccine as possible. And the Chinese mainland has probably the largest production capacities in the world. And why should you ignore the Chinese vaccines and search for others which are not available? And meantime, the people in Taiwan are suffering. So I think uh, uh, they need to really come back to the ground and really look at the realities and really putting the lives of the Taiwanese people as the top priority, because otherwise they will be vetoed, they will be kicked out of the office very soon, I hope, by the Taiwanese people. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Professor uh, Wu, over there, you see uh, the goal of the Taiwan government right now is like to uh, vaccinate 60% of the island's population at the end of October. Um, not exactly uh, unachievable, probably, but uh, again, you know, uh, considering the vaccine availability of vaccines, uh, um, you know, how, how is that? Is that possible? Or is 60% uh, vaccination enough to stop this, you know, spread of the virus? Well, actually, uh, first, uh, uh, in the expert circle, the, the general consensus is that to build up the herd immunity, you need to vaccinate about 75 to 80 percent of the population. The second is that uh, if you look at the Taiwan's current vaccination rates, it's very low. At the current speed, actually, the Bloomberg News just uh, estimated that Taiwan needs about uh, more than six years to reach 75% uh, of vaccination rates. So this is uh, uh, just outrageous because uh, this is reflecting the Taiwanese government the failure to do the preparation, build up, uh, you know, sign the uh, bilateral contract to procure uh, sufficient vaccines for the island's use. So uh, it's a clear indication that the government failed uh, the, the people's uh, need. Um, I, I think this is something actually they need to work out a new formula, finding a new sources of vaccines. As just uh, Victor Gao mentions that uh, China is, the mainland China is one of the largest vaccine producers in the world and the China is willing to provide the efficacious vaccines to the island. I think this is something actually I was appalled that they simply refused. And I, I just read the news as well that uh, the local uh, Red Cross just across the, uh, the Taiwan Strait in China, they are willing to offer some vaccine help uh, to, to two islands like Kingmen and the Taiwan. Uh, government refused. Mm -hmm. So this is a clear indication that put the politics about the uh, people's life. Yeah, a politics uh, before people's lives. Uh, thank you, Professor Wu. Uh, now we turn to China-U.S. relations. The Pentagon has uh, sent a defense budget proposal uh, mounting to 715 billion U.S. dollars to Congress. On Friday, this proposal includes an investment of $5 billion in what's termed the Pacific Deterrence Initiative for China. Where will the defense budget go from here and where are China-U.S. relations headed? For answers, we are joined by Harvey Zodan, Senior Fellow of Center for China and Globalization. So, Victor, we'll start with you here. You know, this uh, uh, Pacific Initiative, deterrence initiative, obviously is targeting China. As you said, they made it very public here. What kind of a signal, you know, it is sending to, to China, to the region, to China-U.S. relations here? Well, first of all, uh, we all know that the United States has the largest military budget in the world, and it's much, much bigger than the Chinese uh, defense budget or any other country's budget. And uh, uh, this is actually a huge waste of the resources of the American people. Now, the U.S. government under President Biden still wants to view China as an enemy, uh, even though sometimes they say the relations has cooperation, uh, competition and uh, rivalry. Uh, but they really uh, cannot get rid of the misconception that China is the enemy of the United States. Now, on that misconception, this is very dangerous for the United States as well as for China, and they want to spend as much as possible, which is a huge waste of resources, and they want to contain China. Contain China for what? China has the right of peaceful development, and the Chinese people have the right to improve their living standards, 
And China and the United States should find a way to live and let live. We need to get along mm -hmm. for mutual benefit, if possible, and at least to minimize a wasteful military spending or create a rivalry or a new Cold War, which is bad for the Chinese people and the American people and mankind as a whole. So I hope President Biden really will come back to senses and put China in a more perspective, uh, more objective perspective, and make sure that the Chinese people and the American people can get along with each other. Mm -hmm. Well, Harvey, uh, thank you for joining us again here. Uh, U.S. Defense Secretary uh, Lloyd Austin uh, basically said that uh, you will see a significant investment in our naval forces and probably the largest ever request for research, development, testing, and evaluation uh, for the development of technologies. Uh, you know, what do you make of this um, Biden administration's defense budget here overall? Well, like the geographic pivot from Europe and the Middle East, uh, uh, the fiscal year 2022 defense budget represents a pivot from old technology to new higher tech. It's every bit as great as from using horses in World War I to using new mechanized weapons on land, on the sea, in the air in World War II. And that's not to forget nuclear weapons. It's a clear recognition that the battlefield of the future is as much or more so in outer space and under the sea than it is on the land. It also recognizes that artificial intelligence is as or, or more important than human intelligence. And it recognizes that while for the last 70 years, uh, the U.S. has had a competitive edge in new technology, much of that lead eroded. The budget recognizes that old tech, even advanced fighter jets and nuclear subs could no longer be as cutting edge in the future. So just as horses and trench warfare couldn't be further leveraged a century ago, the same thing now. Take as an example, hypersonic weapons, systems that travel more than five times the speed of sound, in which China and Russia are seen to have an edge. While the U.S. would like to bleed, to, to beat swords into plowshares, like uh, Victor suggested, the best defense is a good offense. Well, a good point over there. I mean, fundamentally, it's about this bilateral relationship. I mean, if you have a a sound and a stable relationship, but you don't view each other as you know, a rival or even enemy over there. So you do need to prepare uh, militarily against each other. Uh, then, you know, if you come back to the bilateral relations here, you have this Kurt Campbell, uh, the um, uh, Asia policy coordinator of the US, basically said that uh, engagement is over. Um, you know, Harvey, you are based still in Europe right now. What do you see of this, uh, you know, the judgment of this relationship? Well, engagement is over, now it's a new chapter of uh, uh, a competition. Frankly, I'm really uh, disappointed. Uh, I thought that the three C's of compete, confront, and cooperate was barely acceptable as Biden's announced strategy before, because it still left room to cooperate on matters where our national interests overlap like on climate change and pandemic control. But for Dr. Campbell to say, as he did at Stanford, that the era of engagement dating back a half century to Nixon and Mao is over is both sad and wrongheaded. Of course, the world's two most powerful countries are destined to compete and confront each other. That pretty much goes with the territory of great power competition, but it's leading us into the jaws of the Thucydides trap and global annihilation. This shouldn't be about which system of governance is superior because one size doesn't fit all. It should be about building a diverse community of shared future for all of mankind and competing in a race to the top and not a race to oblivion. Mm -hmm. Well, Victor, obviously, in response to the Chinese side, uh, uh, Foreign Minister spokesman uh, Zhao Lijian you know, said that it was completely wrong of Washington to use competition to define the relationship between the two countries. And Beijing firmly rejected the U.S. efforts to exclude, contain, and surprise China under the banner of competition. Seems to me it's really about what kind of competition. There are healthy competition, win-win competition, or non-zero-sum competition. 
But uh, you know, if it is a zero-sum competition, it, it can get worse quickly, become confrontation or even conflicts over there. Well, first of all, when the Americans are talking about competition, we need to ask what kind of competition? What are China and the United States competing uh, with each other for? For example, the United States believes it is the top dog in the world. Does China want to compete with the United States to become the top dog of the world? Seems no. not the case. <laughs> no, I don't think the Chinese government or the Chinese party or the Chinese people want to be the top dog of the world. If the Americans enjoy being the top dog of the world, let them enjoy that. Uh, on the other hand, the Chinese economic growth is inevitable. No one can stop that. Does Washington really believe they have a way to stop China's economic development? Does Washington really believe they can deprive the Chinese people of improving their living standards? I would say to stop Chinese people's right of economic development is the biggest crime against humanity. So I hope Washington will really come back to its senses and realize when you talk about competition, name it. What are you afraid of competing with China? And don't get confused because China does not want to be the top dog of the world. We do not see any pleasure or joy of becoming the top dog of the world. So let China and the United States talk in an intelligent way and figure out what's the best way to handle their relations. But anyway, the United States is not in a position to hold China down without suffering consequences and mutually assured destruction does not serve the fundamental interest of the no, American no. people nor the Chinese people. Armageddon is not good for America as well as for China. So there is only one thing left, that is to live and to let live. We need to get along. We need some room for cooperation. Uh, but Harvey, before we go on this topic, uh, uh, tell us, you know, President Biden has ordered the intelligence community of the U.S. Uh, to give him a report in 90 days about this, uh, uh, you know, lab leak theory about the COVID-19. Um, so why is the, you know, the government pursuing such previously considered, uh, you know, conspiracy theory here? It's because of tremendous domestic political pressure by uh, the Republicans, which the Democrats have joined in. And it's very sad, actually, because it seems to me that we've just experienced a great tragedy in China, in the U.S., and are experiencing it globally uh, until this very day and into the future. So what we should be doing is not blaming each other and not looking uh, where to point fingers, but looking how we can cooperate both to end COVID-19 and also the scientists tell us that a much bigger, worse uh, dilemma or uh, disease could come to us in the near future. We have to be prepared for that. We're not, as the last couple of years has shown. We need to work together or we're not going to make it. Thank you, Javi, over there. Let's leave it there for now and take a look at this week's Newsmaker. It had been the first anniversary of the death of George Floyd, a black American who was murdered by a white Minneapolis police officer to find out how much has racial discrimination in American society changed since his death. We are joined by, via Skype by Professor Ray Baker at Towson University. Uh, but before we join us, Victor here, you know, what do you see you know, that has been changed over the past year in the U.S.? Well, uh on the one hand, there is much greater awareness that black lives do matter and lives of many other minorities do matter. And it is wrong to practice racial discrimination and bigotry against minorities, uh, including the uh, Afro-Americans. On the other hand, I don't think there has been major institutional reform or change to the deeply rooted prejudices and racism or white supremacism in the United States, which eventually, if not 
checked and reformed will lead to the downfall of the United States as a country. So I think the worst enemy is actually in the United States themselves. The enemy of the United States is actually the United States. They need to figure out a way to restructure their racial system and make sure that everyone in the United States, regardless of his or her faith, color, and age, for example, should be treated equal. Mm -hmm. That's the most important part of human rights. And unless the United States really fundamentally addresses this problem, they probably are not qualified to talk about human rights anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Ray, thank you here. Uh, obviously, we know that uh, on the anniversary of the 25th, I think, of this month, um, it was supposed to pass a, um, a bill, the called uh, Policing Act, I believe, uh, but it obviously is overdue. Uh, it uh, is still in the Senate. So what's in the bill and why it is delayed? There are several things that are in the bill that are really contentious for those elected officials here in the United States. Some of the things involve the idea of qualified immunity. Qualified immunity, and this is just very broadly, suggests that police and law enforcement officers have a wide range of discrepancy and space for whatever their behavior may do that may end up injuring or harming someone else in the line of their duty. The mere idea that they're performing a duty that is necessary to the function and protection of public safety allows law enforcement officers this latitude to get away with things that we've ultimately seen to be harmful and violent. Some other reforms that are a less contentious but are just as important are bans on chokeholds, restrictions on no-knock warrants, in Louisville, Kentucky, in the United States, Brianna Taylor, a black woman, was killed in her sleep because police issued a no-knock warrant believing that there was someone who was a criminal in, the, in her apartment. That person was not there. In fact, that person had already been arrested earlier that day, but law enforcement officers still engaged in entering, the, entering her home with guns drawn, engaging in a brief shootout with her partner that was in the home, who was under the belief that the home was being robbed and burglarized. So these are just some of the pieces and issues that are in this United States package that is a national law. But various states have attempted to put into place personal reforms, not personal, but reforms within their states to limit or end qualified immunity, to ban chokeholds, to demand body crammers, to put more money and investment into police reform training. And we'll see how those developments take shape. But there's not great reason to be optimistic of police reform in the United States, regardless of what passes, because of the history of reforms time and again. Even before this great tumult of 2020, there were pushback and advocates on the street demanding greater police accountability. And the reforms that have been offered thus far to this point have not done enough to stymie the violence that police initiate against American citizens, particularly black American citizens. Mm -hmm. Well, so you have one minute, uh, less than one minute left, uh, you know. So if the bill is delayed in terms of its approval, so, so much less uh, probably to be desired in terms of uh, defunding the police over there. Absolutely. The idea of defunding the police is not merely taking money away from one place, but putting money to another place. We have statistics and data that tell us that crime in the United States is largely questions of crimes of need. If we can change people's material needs by allocating our public resources there, then we don't have to worry about allocating our public resources into protection because they will not, mem members of society will not have the same incentive to commit the crime in the first place. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Professor Ray over there and Victor. With that, we are coming to the end of today's show. Again, thanks to our guests. You can also watch us on the CGTN app or on YouTube. I'm Xu Qingdu. You can find me on Twitter, Xu Qingdu in one word. Thanks for watching. See you next week. <laughs>